Welcome to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, the number one resource for automotive sales professionals, managers, and owners to learn how to make money, accumulate wealth, and to all out ball out in the auto industry. And now your hosts, Sean V. Bradley and L.A. Williams. One, two, three, four, three. M3. Hey everybody, this is Sean B. Bradley, president of Dealer Synergy and Creative the Millionaire Car Salesman Group and Creative the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. And I'm excited to have a, a guest today. His name is David Kirby. So David is a, an avid listener of the podcast. He heard the podcast and he texted uh, like the free strategy session and here we are. And what I figured and I was telling David is that you know, uh, unless it's something private or personal, you know what I mean? Then I would, I would not go on the air on this, but I figure, man, that he probably has some questions or challenges that some of you have. I mean, there's 25,000 members in the group and there's like hundreds of thousands plus downloads on the podcast. So I figure, okay, if I could help one person, let me start to see if I could help everybody else. So David, um, first of all, how long you been a listener, uh, in, in the, in the group or in the podcast for? So when I can, I listen to it uh, mainly on my commute, um, along with a couple handful of other other podcasts and stuff. Probably in 2020 was when I started selling cars, so that's really when I started looking for knowledge outside of my dealership because um, I found out pretty quick that there's usually not a whole lot of uh, knowledge on actually kind of anything outside of just the day to day process of how to how to sell a car on paper, how to actually generate traffic, how to build yourself up. That's kind of stuff that you have to go outside of a dealership to learn in my experience, at least where I've worked at. And how, let, let me just, I'm going to d- develop a quick profile with you. And, and it's, yeah. it's like, if you're an up, right. And yeah. at the dealership, you got to qualify them before you do the proper product selections. And before I start diagnosing, uh, you know, strategies, I want to find a little bit about you. Okay. So where are you based out of? Augusta, Georgia. Okay. I actually got a bunch of stores out there, Augusta, Georgia. Okay. Know the area pretty well. And what franchises do you work for? So I work for a family owned dealership that has a FCA store. Um, well, I guess it's Stellantis now, yeah. um, a Toyota store and a Chevrolet store. So you work for, so you, they sell the full Stellantis line of the Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Yeah. Yeah. Everything except for the Fiat. Yeah. So Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Toyota, and Chevrolet. Holy yes, crap. Sir. Now, is that on one complex or is it like an auto mall? It's uh, three different complexes, but we're able to sell. So we, where I'm at, I'm selling out of the Chrysler side. So I'm able to sell all three. Um, sometimes if I sell a new Toyota or a new Chevrolet, I mm-hmm. have to get one of them that's certified to do the delivery. I mean, commission's still all mine, but the money that comes from the manufacturer will go to whoever's actually certified. So you legitimately get to sell if you if you need to the whole suite. Yes, sir. Okay, oh, yeah. good. Um, tell me about your the used car inventory because if it's three complexes, I'm sure you're able to sell from each other's used car inventory. Yeah. Okay. Over- how many? Real quick, how, approximately how many retail ready pre owned cars do you have in stock? Um, retail ready. I would say probably anywhere from, it varies quite a bit. So probably anywhere from 50 to 150, depending on the month. I mean, for for the entire group, you like sometimes as low as 50 cars. Sometimes. Yeah. It's, it's gotten, it's, it's been a while since it's been that bad, but it's gotten that bad before. So in the last 90 days, what would you say that the average is? Don't range me, hit me with like, like an average number. Well, I can tell you right now because I just started back. I'd left them for a while and, and tried my hand at another dealership and it just, their model didn't work for, I guess, how I knew how to sell. Everybody's got to kind of get in where they fit in. But um, so I came back about a week and a half ago. We've probably got about 80 or 90 retail ready cars to go and probably another 50 that are still going through service. Wow. Okay. So let me tell you this, and this is, it's actually, believe it or not, a good thing. Uh, national average before the pandemic, before the inventory crisis was only about 75 to 80 units. Okay. So, and, and I understand you have three complexes, so it's not like just the one store, but still to have access to 90 pre-owned cars post apocalyptic pandemic, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, drama 
uh, for, you know, uh, shits and giggles is in there, but is not that bad. All right. So I, I, let me just recap what we found about you sell two top tier one products. Toyota is a tier one product. Mm-hmm. Chevy is a tier one product. Now Chrysler Jeep Ram, it might not be a tier one product, but they have some really good vehicles, especially like the Ram 1500, et cetera. You have 80 to 90 pre-owned there. Now let's go through the salespeople. Um, which complex do you primarily work out of? Uh, the Chrysler store. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. How many salespeople at the Chrysler store? And then how many total salespeople for the complex do you have? I don't know about salespeople for the complex. I know we've got 10 at Chrysler though. Okay. So you're one of 10 in Chrysler, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And how many units does the Chrysler store average per month? Um, probably. Now this is what we push out of the store. So we can push out of all three stores too, mm-hmm. but I know that our store is usually in a hundred to 120 a month. Okay, so doing basic math without getting into specifics, then just just dividing it by 10 people. That means that the salespeople are averaging about 10 to 12 units per month. What would you say you, your average is per month? Like I said, I just got Understood. back there. But before I left there, because um, not a whole lot of the numbers have changed, uh, I was anywhere from 15 to 17 a month. Okay, so help me understand this. If if you if if the if your store only averages ten to twelve units, and you are selling fifteen to seventeen units, I mean that's a lot better than everybody else. I'm not saying that you're making grosses yet. I haven't asked that question, but um, if you don't mind me asking, you decided to leave because what was the reason that prompted you to leave the dealership? Well, I was I left to. Um... It was completely different opportunity, starting my own business, doing something completely unrelated. Ah, so it, it wasn't working. I thought you were going at You said you went to another dealership, though. Yeah, before I came back. So long story short, yeah, uh, started my own business. A um, couple things fell through with that. Went to solar sales for a while. And then Gosh. when I realized that that really wasn't, in my opinion, what it was hyped up to be, I guess maybe because I'm used to actually getting paid a little bit quicker from the car industry. Yeah. Um, so my buddy pulled me over to a Miracle Toyota store. He's like, hey, man, this is where it's at. Within three days of being there, uh, he pulled me outside and was like, man, that management's just came in. The store's flipped upside down. I'm sorry I brought you here. If you want to go back to, to Milton Rubin where you were before, that's probably what you need to do because he was already looking at going back to his old dealership. Right. So, ah, um, okay, good. So, and I, you're helping me. I'm de- I'm developing a, an understanding of profile. Okay, great. Now, at your dealership, at, at the at the complex one, right? Mm-hmm. Very important questions. Um, you went through OEM certification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which one? All all of them? Toyota, Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Chevy, or just CDJR? Just CDJR. Okay, so let's talk about that. Now, just just be honest, because again, this is amnesty. I'm not your manager. I'm not your boss. So I can't get you in trouble. And I'm damn sure not going to call your dealership. Uh, yeah. My name ain't 6'9". You know what I mean? My name is SVB. So yeah. what I want to find out is, did you actually go and do all of the certification? Because I find that most salespeople, they don't. They either flim flam it or they pay somebody else to do whatever. Let's start there. Did you actually go through the training to put your most incredible effort to master the product knowledge and shit like that? Or did you not? No. And I got to get recertified this time too, but I'll be honest with you. I quizleted the whole thing last time I went. That's, I mean, I was, you know, on paper, a, a Ram pro, a technology pro and all that stuff, but it was, you know, I just didn't sit through the course. Cause like you said, that's, it's what you see other people doing. And so it's kind of what you do to get to, and the managers almost kind of encourage it too. Cause it's like, don't waste time doing the training. We, we need you on the floor selling a car kind of thing. Yeah, L- Listen, brother, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're speaking truth and 
thank you because I'm trying to help you. You know what I mean? And I can't, you can't, if I'm a doctor, you can't be embarrassed if you've got a rash in some weird places that I didn't want you, you could keep that rash or you could get the doctor to fix it. But if you don't tell me the whole details, I'm not going to be able to, to put this together. And I, I love the fact that you're being so transparent because I've been having this conversation a lot that you're not alone. You're not the weird one. I mean, like it, this is an epidemic. My, both my daughters sell cars and they've told me that they've got that. Here's what normally happens. Either this people in the dealership are like, man, you don't need that bullshit. Stop yeah. wasting your time. This stupid man i mean and then there's people that are hustlers like man you don't need to do that bullshit give me twenty dollars give me fifty dollars and i'll do the test for you you know or, or whatever it might be and the example that you just said on your own i didn't even prompt you was that some of management was like man you don't need that bullshit i need you on the floor right now but here's the situation okay product knowledge is incredibly important because subject matter expertise is what's going to make you more confident and more fluid. Do you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, I don't know if anybody's taking the time to share this with you, but price is only relevant with the absence of value. You know what I mean? Which mm-hmm. means that you know things. price only really matters if you're not building value and hitting their value points. So the only thing a regular person understands is what does it cost? Oh, that shit's too expensive. It's yeah. only expensive to people that don't see value. You know what I mean? Like there is shit that is, that, that is priceless to me that might be not priceless to somebody else. You know what I mean? But to me, it's priceless. Literally, I would pay anything or do anything to. I'll give you an example. My, my wife's you know, health, my children's security or whatever. You know what I mean? So again, you can't put a price tag on something like that. So again, here's the thing is if we don't ever master the product, we are not going to ever be you know, that superior confident advocate to try to build value on something. So uh, here's my first bit of advice. Honestly, you know, there's a lot of shit we could get into and I could get into marketing, but here's the problem. Before we got into this, you're like, I I need some help in marketing advertising. Wait a minute. I'm not saying that you don't, you might need that, but let's say we do that. Let's say you got all these ups or whatever. If you're not going to maximize them, you know, each and every one of those opportunities, you're just swimming upstream. You could keep your distance. You could, you could get somewhere, but why swim against the freaking current? Why swim upstream when you could freaking coast downstream? You you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like in in, in a, in a, Freaking like think of like a snow hill and you're or a bobsled and shit. Whoosh, that's how I want to get to my destination. Yeah. In class, in style, and expeditiously. You know what I mean? In my TI voice. Shout out to ATL, right? <laughs> so let's go through this now. Um, man, that's crazy. So I would really recommend that you master the product. Now, there's several different levels of mastering the product. Okay, so let's go into this. Let's just use your the vehicle so the ram 1500 what is the number one uh competitor of the ram 1500 i didn't say a competitor i said the number one competitor and you, uh, you hesitate way too long you should yeah. have written like that what is it i mean i'll, I'll take a stab the uh, f-150 that's correct do you know why the f-150 I mean, in my head, it's just because it's the most comparable vehicle to the 1500 as far as the, the uh, features, the ride quality, the cabin size, all that stuff. That, but something even more bigger. Okay. The fact that the F-150 single-handedly is the number one selling vehicle on planet Earth for 45 straight years. There are more f one fifty sold than entire lineups. I think there's more F-150 sold in the entire lineup of VW or something like that and crazy stuff. So when you have, your, when you're a competitor, you're, you're actually correct, class to class, F-150 and the Chevy Silverado, you know, and the Ram 1500 and the GMC Sierra and the, you know, the Toyota Tundra, they're all in the same class. And so, but what makes the F-150 the, the most deadly competitor is that it outsells everything and everybody else, period. So not only do you need to know, in my opinion, all of your Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, you know, product knowledge, you know, if, ands, buts, all those details. So you could do an immaculate, um, you know, features and benefits product presentation to build value. But to, to go a step further, you need to know 
about what the chief competitors are for each of those vehicles. And I got to be honest with you, if it was, if I was a Chevy salesperson, it's a little bit easier. There's a lot of models, but it's just one lineup. You've got Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, et cetera. And then Mm -hmm. we have all these EVs that are coming out and all that other stuff. I'm not saying it's easy and it's not. And that's why some people don't do it or they're like, ah, that's a waste of time because it's like sensory overload. And it's hard, brother. It's hard when your managers are like, don't do that shit. Come over here. But sometimes, sometimes you have to take a, you have to stop or take a step back just so you're prepared to be able to take three steps forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so my, my, my first advice is basic. It's going to sound is, is product knowledge is absolutely imperative. What will give you a competitive edge is if you are a better product specialist, let me tell you something. Do you know what NADA says? The average person that's looking to buy, let's just use the Ram 1500 and the, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Ram 1500. Let's say somebody's looking for the Ram 1500. How many other dealerships or websites do you think that person is looking at? Shoot, I don't know. Maybe like nine to 11. NADA 2022 data says that the average prospect is cross shopping their brands. As a matter of fact, many years ago, Google did a cross shopper analysis report with uh, compete and pulp data that says that approximately, you know, 70% of people that are looking at a Ram 1500, 100% are going to look at the F-150 or the, uh, the Silverado or the Sierra. So I'm going to repeat mm-hmm. that. If somebody's looking at whatever product, you've got to assume that they are going to be looking at the, that, the same vehicle at a different dealership. So they're going to probably look at, at a Ram 1500 at another dealership to try to see if they could get the exact options and colors or get a better price. So not, not only are they shopping against you at other Ram 1500 dealers, but they're also looking at the competing, you know, manufacturers like Chevy, um, you know, like GMC, like Toyota or whatever it might be. So it is imperative that when they speak to you, that you have a better rap. You've got a better presentation, faster response time, better communication, better personality than everybody else. And the only way to really do that on, on an initial level is to be a superior subject matter expert, a better product specialist, a better consultant to be able to devise somebody, you know, why your vehicle is the best vehicle to buy. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Make All right. Sense. Next step from there is this, and I already know the answer. I can already tell where we're going with this. Okay. Um, how long did you work at your, your dealership? I know you took a hiatus, but how long have you been totally at that store? Let's see. Probably about six months in total, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. Well, man, I'm going to tell you this right now, and this is a compliment, okay? You've only been at that dealership for six total months, and you've already got between 15 and 17 units. National average is less than 10 cars. Do you understand that right now? Before the pandemic, it was about 9.6. Now it's about like 8.6, around nine, but it's still not even 10 cars. So for you to be legitimately about 50 to 70% higher on your volume than the average person, and you kind of like, you know, uh, kind of whisk your way through the product knowledge that I've been doing, it shows that you've got some skills, obviously. So that's the compliment. But my next question is, did the dealership provide you any detailed training on, you know, like the road to the sale? No, no, they had, uh, and they do this with a lot of people. I was, I was working across the street and they, I guess, probably had seen I, I do a lot of Facebook posts in my sales and stuff. I do little videos, little key drop photos, whatever. And um their sales manager had seen me doing those and had seen that I was selling a decent bit. So he, you know, pretty much just let me peek behind the curtain of their pay plan, how much they were moving, uh, and and their process and everything. And I liked it. So I moved from an infinity dealer to this dealer. Okay. Now, let me finish this one trajectory and I'm going to go back to that because I like I already knew my spidey senses were going off as soon as I started talking to you and telling me what's going on. So you're telling me that nobody, or at least the, the Chrysler Dodge dealership, Chevy, um, Toyota, they never taught you the road to the sale, which is the, the proper greeting, the proper qualification, the proper product selection, proper features and benefits walk around, the proper, you know, demonstration drive, the service walk, the negotiations, the first pencil, second pencil with a trade appraisal, that stuff. They, they never showed you a series of steps like that? 
No, not not at this dealer. No, I was never sure. I think it was kind of assumed that I just knew it. Yeah, but here assuming things is makes an asset out of yeah. you and me. You get it right. So yeah. again, it's it's not it's it's not the right thing to do. Now, before I I, I give you some coaching on that, I'm going to go back and say the other thing is. Brother, you're bouncing around. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm watching Ice Age and the squirrel and shit. You know what I mean? You're looking for that, yeah. that nut all over the place. Here's another big advice. What you want to be careful doing is, is jumping from dealership to dealership. I know that might be easier said than done. So I'm not saying that you're wrong. I don't know what this motivating you, but I'm telling you this. I wish somebody had said this to me back in the day. You know, I was averaging 33 units a month, but if I didn't leave for whatever reason, I would have been able to develop my roots. What you've got to do is find the right place. But you, but a lot of times um, there was this, oh, this is, you're young. You know what I mean? There, there was, um, Eddie Murphy did this skit uh, about like the little rascals and the guy Buckwheat. It was like, look in Pudnab and all the wrong places. What I'm saying is that most salespeople are looking for love in all the wrong places. What that means is they, they think, <clears throat> The grass is going to be better at, you know, at a different dealership. Me personally, I don't give a fuck about the grass, the lawn, the concrete. I'm a beast. I'm going to make my money wherever I'm at. If I'm not going to, this is from experience though. I don't need to go to a dealership that's going to give me an umbilical cord and magic sales and this and that. What I want to be able to do is find a dealership that's going to give me opportunity. A dealership that's got inventory. Okay, is important. I can't sell nothing to nobody. I need something yeah. to sell. So I need inventory. The next thing I'm going to need is I need a dealership that's going to provide me the opportunities at first until I could build my book of business, until I could get my marketing, advertising, and branding on prospecting on and referrals pumping. I need to have access to the umbilical cord. That's going to be walk in ups. That's going to be phone ups. That's going to be internet ups. That's going to be the service drive. That's going to be orphan owners. That's going to be, you know, data mining, equity mining stuff. That's going to be the BDC. See, some dealerships don't allow salespeople to sell from those things. So let me ask you, the current dealership that you're at right now, are you able to take walk-in fresh ups? Yes. Are you able to take internet ups? Oh, yeah. I'm one of the few that is, yeah. Okay, good. See, my point, one of the few that is. Are you able to take phone ups? Yes. Are you able to work the service drive? Yes. Okay. Are you able to get uh, orphan owners? No, not, are not, are not you, selecting them myself. Sometimes they do get dumped into my follow-up. Have you ever went to your boss and said, Hey, can I get a shitload of orphan owners? Honestly, no. there no, you go. So you don't know that. So you don't know, right now. What about data mining, equity mining, lease terminations, things like that. Do you have access to any of that stuff? Um, I don't have access to it. No. Can you ask, have you ever asked to have access to that? No. Okay. And that's cool. Like, see, and that's the thing is what you don't, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So one of the things is this, I want to, I say this all the time on the podcast, but it's so real. There's eight ways. And I repeat this folks, there's eight ways that any car salesperson can sell a car theoretically. And when I say theoretically, I mean, unless the dealership stops you from it. So walking ups is one. B backs is two. Internet ups is three. Phone ups is four prior customers or orphan owners is five. See, because a, an orphan owner is a prior customer of the dealership. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a your prior customer as long as they bought from the dealership before. Service drive is six. Referral generation is seven. And the lost art of prospecting is eight. Those are eight separate categories. They're not close. They're not this, but most salespeople don't understand that. They Most salespeople only operate, this is such so, a, a travesty, my friend. They only operate on two or three out of the eight ways. Literally every month, if they're honest with themselves, see, most salespeople don't even track their metrics the right way. They don't track their ups. They don't track the source. They don't track this. They don't track that. They don't track shit. And so at the end of the month, they, they, they kind of guess, man, I sold 17 cars. Watch, I'm, you're on the air, brother. So let's play, but I'm here to help you. So I don't mean any, any disrespect by this. The last time you sold 17 cars or 15 cars, how long ago was that? Shoot, that was last. That was last March or last April. Okay, so fair almost, enough. That's too far. Year. I'm not going to yeah. ask you back that question, but let's just pretend that it was last month. And I said to you, David, 
you sold 17 cars last month. Where did you get your cars from? What do you mean? And then I'm like, where did you sell your cars from? I'll give you the first hint. How many were walk-ins? And they're going to say, I sold seven. And I'm like, "Uh, did you spot all seven? What do you mean? Did you spot them the first time they came in? No. Okay, then they're not seven walk-ins. There might only be four or five walk-ins and there's two B-backs. See, the problem is this. If we're not tracking it the right way and analyzing the data, how are we ever going to know where to tweak and where to move and where to enhance ourselves? Does that make sense? It does. And I do. Um, so what I usually do is keep a log so I can figure out because I do. Um, I pull some customers off of Facebook and I will I will at least source where they come from, whether it's a fresh up appointment, Internet, Facebook, um, referral, stuff like that. Uh, I, I track that. I like to track the gross on them. So I know what my average pause right there, pause. is. I know what you like to do and what other people like to do, but you're missing. So here's my thing is. Are you tracking walk-ins versus be-backs in a month? Yes or no? Um, I put, I'll put them in as appointments. I don't know if it's the first. I won't track it whether it's the first or second. So then do me a favor. I'm your friend here. I'm not beating you up. I'm here. So I get, you're either pregnant or not pregnant. There's no half pregnant in my system, right? So yeah. the, the question is, do you track walk-ins and be-backs separately? The answer is no, though. Right or wrong? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's, that's an adjustment you need to make right there. Next, you're tracking internet ups, correct? Yeah. Are you tracking phone ups? Yeah. Are you tracking prior customers or orphan owners? No. Okay. That's a missed opportunity right there. Even if you don't have a a book of business for prior customers, my brother, you understand that the highest closing ratio by far has always been repeat customers, repeat customers and, and which are, you know, prior customers or, or orphan owners have a 65% closing ratio versus a fresh up non-appointment. I'm not talking about an appointment or BDC, but a fresh walk-in is only an 18 to 25% closing ratio. 18 to 25% versus 65. So for me, I I don't want to swim upstream. I need to get me some orphan owners until I can build up my prior customers. Next, do you work the service drive at all? Yes. Okay. Now, do you realize that that's a good thing because NADA says that a service customer is seven times as likely to purchase a vehicle from where they service a car from? It's extremely important. Service drive. What about referrals versus prospects? There's a lot of people, they don't know how to differentiate. They think they're the same thing, but a referral is completely different than a prospect. Are you aware of that? Uh, no. What's okay, the difference? Well, no. Well, it's a very big difference. It's subtle. But it's a it's it's a magnet it's a it's a gargantuan difference. A referral means that somebody else created the opportunity and gave it to you. So, for example, if let's say you know you're my friend or you're my my family member or hell you're my friend of me you're my high school bully whatever the fuck you are right to me right. If you turn around and I know that you sell cars and I go to my my friend Frank and I'm like hey Franca you need to buy a car I got a friend um, his name is David Kirby he works. At a, at a Chrysler Dodge Ram dealership and, and they got some good cars. So now if Frank comes to you, you didn't generate that prospect yourself. Your referral agent did, which was me. I referred that to you versus if I turn around and I go into a bar or a diner or a, or a restaurant and I have a conversation with my server, with my waitress or my waiter, right? And I'm like, hey, are you in the market for a car? And they're like, actually, how did you know? I am. I, I, my car is all fucked up. I need a new car. Okay. Now I created the opportunity. Or if you're on Facebook and you, you know, post, you live stream in IG or TikTok, you know, your inventory, whatever, and somebody responds, oh my God, that's a great car. I would love to have that. If you generate the opportunity yourself, that's a prospect. Does that make sense? It does. So that's a separate category. So one of the things that you want to do is know in the beginning of the month that you have eight different ways that you could sell a car from. Eight different ways. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Walk in, be back, internet, phone, prior customers, slash orphan owners, service conversions, referrals, and prospecting. So now you have eight different ways that you can sell an automobile. And what I'm going to say to you, David, is this, is that um, most salespeople, especially if they're, they're just getting back into the industry like you are, or they're brand new to the industry, or they just you know, change stores or whatever it is, if they don't have a book of business, what normally happens is this, they need to live off the land is what I call it, or live off the umbilical cord until 
they could get their book of business ramped up and or until they could build their own marketing engine, whether it's through organic or paid ads and start creating their own ups themselves. Mm -hmm. But the strategy should be to live off the land until you could be self-sustained and you don't need to take any ups. The, I'm going to tell you this right now, the, the most successful people like the Chrissy Burtons, this is a, a female in Indiana um, who, who sold 74 cars in one month with no assistance, all special finance deals. She's a beast. This is now, this is not normal. And I'm not saying it's easy. I've never even done that shit. I've been doing this for 20, almost 24 years, yeah. but I'm saying she exists. She's real. Then you have my guy, uh, Cody Carter. He sold in December, a couple months ago, he sold 121.5, you know, units. He sold about a thousand units last year. He made $1.1 million, you know, on the showroom floor. It's insane. So again, I actually sold 1,100 cars, my bad. And the idea though is, is this, if you have a diversified approach, I'll give an example, your dealer group, this is, a should click in for you. Why do you think they have three complexes? Quick answer. It's only one answer. Because they cater to different types of customers. No, they don't give a shit about that. Because they can make more money. Because I promise you this right now, if they could sell the same amount of cars or more cars with just the Chevy dealership or just the rooftop, they wouldn't deal with the other bullshit. Ask any owner, the more facilities, there's more liability, there's more oversight from the different manufacturers and all this other stuff. The reason why people that own dealer groups have multiple dealerships is for one reason, more money. Because if they didn't want more money, they would be happy with the one dealership they have. Does that make sense? Yeah. You've heard the phrase how rich people should diversify their income, right? Whether they invest in stocks, bonds, this, that, and what you need to do is diversify your revenue streams. You've got to have multiple layers of revenue streams coming through. If you're just living off of the same ups that are coming through, you're going to be limited. You want to have leads coming from this way, leads coming from this way, leads coming from this way until you build your book of business. Then what you do is you start to cut the fat away. I'll give an example. Internet ups are the lowest closing leads. I'm the internet guy. I've been doing internet sales for 23 and a half years, brother, you know, at a very high level. So I am a huge advocate of the internet. I have pioneered internet sales. I've been doing internet since 1999, for real. So I'm not hating on the internet. But the reality is it's the lowest closing ratio right now in this post pandemic product protocol in the post pandemic protocol right now, the average internet lead closes within 30 days of inception at like 5%. What? Let me be crystal clear. I get 500 leads in a month. 10% is 50. 5% is 25. How in the world am I only selling 25 cars? Because it's the lowest closing ratio. It's the highest gestation period. The average internet up, Chrysler will tell you the average buying cycle before the pandemic was about 90 days, eight, actually 83 to 87 days. Now, because of the pandemic and the, the direct orders and the low inventory and all that other excuse shit, it's now pushed to 120 to 150 days. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. All right, good. Let's go to the next thing. So what I would say is this, you should definitely understand that you have multiple ways that you could sell a car and you could tackle them. So you have to turn around and project manage yourself or time manage yourself. So you're not just living off of the internet ups or the phone ups or the social media ups. You're able to diversify the ways that you are, you know, generating opportunities. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Now, what about skills? Let's role play. I just want to kind of see your skill level because obviously I respect that you got skills. If you're, if you're selling 15 to 17 cars, you have to have some type of skill. So let's just pretend. Uh, which is your favorite vehicle to sell now that you're back? Doesn't really matter. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't give, have a favorite vehicle. Give me, give me just, just name, name a product that you sell. Um, let's see. What's the last thing I sold? Uh, Challenger. Dodge Challenger. Yeah, Dodge Challenger. Perfect. I don't know all the little details in Dodge Challenger, but let's say I'm looking at a 2023 Dodge Challenger. This is my dealer synergy customer worksheet needs assessment. Do you have at your dealership a customer needs assessment? No. Okay, this is going to be fun then. So let's go live. I'm, I'm, and don't worry. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So we're going to do this two different ways. You're going to qualify me. 
And then I'm going to qualify you. And we're going to see who, who, who's a little more thorough. All right. So okay. here's a scenario. You just met me at the dealership. I'm not even going to go. I'm going to skip the meet and greet. You did it. Okay. Great. You introduced yourself. You told me your name and it was perfect. Right. <laughs> and then you sat me down at your desk and let's start the process. How do you sell me a car? Let's start with qualify me. Okay. Um, and you're looking for a challenger. We don't know that yet. We don't know that yet, but I'm not going to be hard. If you just ask me what I'm looking for, I'll tell you Dodge Challenger. So let's start from there. Let's go to role play. Don't tell me what you're going to do now. Now, when I go three, two, one, we're live role play. I'm the up. All right. Three, two, okay. one. I'm the up. Awesome. Uh, first off, thanks for coming into the dealership today, Sean. So let me go ahead and get some information from you just so I can go ahead and make sure we get the vehicle that meets all your wants and needs. So really quick, are you here for a car, truck, or SUV today? I think I'm looking for a, an SUV. I'm looking for the, the Dodge. Is a Challenger an SUV, correct? Or is uh, it- the Challenger is actually going to be the two-door coupe. Oh, man. So that's what my wife wants. I, I'm here actually on a mission for my wife. She sent me in looking for the Challenger, and I thought that it was the SUV. All right. Okay, my wife's got good taste. So it's a two-door yeah. uh, car. Okay, so I guess that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Those are really popular cars. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, just, we've got a decent selection of inventory right now. The challenge is going to come from a V6 to a V8. Um, but before we get into those details, uh, do you know, does she, is she married to a particular color combination as far as the interior and exterior? I know how wives are. She better be only I'm married to me, particular. but uh, what do you mean yeah. married to something else? Gotcha. Um, so did she tell you what color she wants? Yeah, no, she said she prefers black. Okay. And is that same for the interior as well? Um, yeah, we have a kid, so I, I, we don't want to have light color because, you know, if there's yeah. spills or what have you on there. But, yeah, a, a dark interior would be good. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I, I have the same issue. So I'm going to go ahead. I don't want to assume, but I'm going to go ahead and guess you're probably looking for leather interior to be easier to clean as well. Not necessarily. Uh, from what from what she was telling me, the, the the fabric has got like the scotch guard protection, and it's pretty much spill proof. But uh, again, I think leather is nicer, but it sounds more expensive to me. Yeah, well, you always are going to get um, whatever you pay for as far as features. The cool thing about the cars that have leather is they also come with a little bit more bells and whistles. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is: Is there any must-have features like? Absolutely won't take the car unless it has wireless Apple CarPlay, 360 view camera, stuff like that, that she may have mentioned to you. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. Like um, we both want navigation because I'm not really good with direction, stuff like that. And we've had some interesting, you know, family vacations. So yeah. navigation, Apple CarPlay is is mandatory. Um, I, I would I, it's just for that, as far as mandatory, those are the mandatory things. OK. Awesome. awesome. And rear view camera. Okay. Gotcha. So we've kind of got a basic outline of what we're looking for as far as the vehicle goes. Um, and that's usually the hardest part is just selecting the right vehicle. But just to make sure I stay in a frame that, that fits what you're looking to accomplish today, have y'all discussed anything as far as budget going? And do you know if you'll be financing or paying cash for the vehicle today? Um. Yeah, I wanted to, as far as my budget goes, I want to be as as cheap as possible. I'm not trying to like spend too much, but uh, definitely going to be financing. I'm not going to be paying cash on this if if we find the vehicle we're looking for. Gotcha. And did you have a a vehicle to to trade in as well? Is she replacing something or are we just getting an additional vehicle right now? Um, I don't think I'm trading the vehicle in. Okay, awesome. So let me ask you this. Um, we know we're financing. Or is that going to be zero down financing or have you all budgeted for a down payment? You guys are offering 0% financing or zero down payment? Zero down payment for, yes, yes, sir. So what, how, the, how the down payments obviously work is it's going to behoove you to, to put money down because it's going to lower that monthly payment for you. I don't know what your monthly budget is and I don't know exactly how much you have in the bank right now if i did uh that make this a lot easier obviously but what i need to know is um how much you would be comfortable with putting down if you want to start with zero down that's perfectly fine uh, then absolutely i'd like to start with zero down 
Gotcha. Gotcha. So what I'm looking at right now, I just want to make sure we got everything uh, correct is that you're looking for a Dodge Challenger. It's going to be black on the outside, black on the inside, uh, open to cloth or leather. We got to have our navigation. We got to have our car play and our rear view camera. And we're looking to get some financing today with no money down. Does that sound correct, Sean? Uh, close. I'm not, I, I didn't say I was married to the black interior, just a dark interior. And um, again, I, like I said before, one of my biggest things is making sure I'm not overpaying for the, for this vehicle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and take a look at our inventory and I'm going to pull up a vehicle that's got everything that you just told me you wanted on it. Um, and we'll take a look at that one. And I'll go ahead and have a couple other options in mind just in case that doesn't fit your needs and wants. Uh, so if you just give me a quick second, did you want anything to drink, by the way? I'm sorry, I should have asked you that when we sat down. Um, just a, a cup of coffee, if that's possible. Okay. Yeah, let me grab that for you, and I'll grab the keys to uh, to the Challenger, and I'm going to pull that up in front so we can uh, take a look at it. I can show you all the bells and whistles on it, make sure it's exactly what you're looking for, and um, I'll be right back in about, give me about two minutes. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. After these messages, we'll be right back. Dealer Synergy is an award-winning training, consulting, CRM, recruiting, and accountability firm. We are a 13-time Dealer Choice Award winner. We have proudly served automotive dealers for 20 years and have trained over 150,000 automotive sales professionals. We've worked with over 3,700 rooftops across the country, not including our global clients in Canada, Russia, the Dominican Republic, and more. We are the most sought after subject matter experts and pioneers of the automotive industry. Our executive team has a combined 75 plus years of automotive industry expertise at the highest level. We've literally taken dealerships from having challenges and problems, some even on the brink of bankruptcy, to becoming national success stories. Dealer Synergy had really helped build something from the ground up. You guys have made me fall in love with what I've always loved to do. I give credit to Dealer Synergy. I just hired eight people, and Dealer Synergy HR really was critical in me being able to do it. You provided the training. You helped us with our CRM. You provided a solution for a lot of things that I was looking for. Our people love LA, what Karen has done to me personally. Franca, her communication back and forth. We've got a really solid group of people. Having somebody like Sean and his company that knows automotive, so the marriage between what knowledge he possesses and the fact that he has this great video production staff, it gives you the best of both worlds. So I would certainly recommend them. Sean comes in the dealership and he advanced us light years ahead of our competition. Just an absolute leading edge training company. Go to BradleyOnDemand.com and give your team access to the best automotive training in the world. How do you think you did on that? Mm, I'm, I'm, I always feel a little awkward in role play, so I feel like I was a little bit more awkward than I normally am, to be honest with you. Um, well, and I, I, wait a minute, stop right there. I, I believe that if you weren't in front of tens of thousands of people right now and you weren't on the uh, with a national trainer and the host – uh, and, and put on the spot because like I don't know you from a can of paint like like people that are listening to this podcast and watching this shit this wasn't rehearsed he just listened to the podcast wanted a free strategy session and I put him on the air so again I think you did considering pretty well but okay so critique yourself before I critique you as a trainer if you were the trainer wh wh how do you think that went and why and what would you do differently um so the first thing that I can see just looking at my notes is that I personally think I probably should have stopped earlier before I even started asking about money. I tend to do a lot better landing on a vehicle before we even bring price into it. Um, other than that, um, generally I'll do two for uh, two for information one for personal when I'm collecting information, just to kind of try and build rapport. I think that's something that I missed doing uh, doing this role play as well, was just kind of building a little bit more rapport. Uh, I do see, I mean, most of the information that I got, you got me with the dark interior. I did write black originally. So I got, I've, I've slipped up there. But other than that, I, I think I did pretty well, all things considered. Yeah. Okay. Now, from somebody that's got, 
24 years of experience as a high level trainer and consultant, I'm going to give you a different perspective on things. Okay. One is this, I don't feel you had a good direction to go in. I know at the end of the day, you had somewhat like you're not, a, you're, you're obviously got skills, man. You already have experience. And I believe that you sell, you know, 15 to 17 cars. However, I want to make your life a lot easier. I want you to remember certain things. One is that you only have one shot to make a first impression. So you want to start the engagement process the right way. Second, what you want to do is understand that time is money. Time is money for you. Time is money on the prospect. What you don't want to do is show me a vehicle that I can't qualify for or that I don't want. NADA says the number one reason why people don't buy cars is because they're landed on the wrong car. I'm going to repeat that. NADA says the number one reason why people don't buy cars is not price. It's not personality. It's not reputation. It's none of the shit that people think it is. It is one major thing. They're not qualified the right way. The, 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 the salesperson and the theoretical TO manager did not identify true wants, wishes, expectation, needs, et cetera things like that right so the other thing here is you left so much opportunity you i i'm going to heavily critique and go through the initial investment the down payment section because nobody taught you that one of the keys to profitability in the deal is down payment you let me go with zero percent you kind of even prompted me with it i i didn't even know that zero zero down uh not pay, not percent zero down was even an option until you volunteered it to me you know so i'm going to show you a different tactic but the first thing i want to do is i'm going to show you this all of my bradley and the man clients and dealer synergy clients this is a custom um needs assessment and don't worry i know you can't read it but you could just see it it's got four squares the reason why is that a car deal is structured on four variables the vehicle of interest the current vehicle and the initial investment and then the monthly investment. I have a certain structure that I go through. I don't believe in monkey scripts. I don't do that. You know what I mean? But I believe in outlines and I believe in trajectory, like, like where the trajectory that I'm trying to go in. So the way that I start is actually close to where you are. I start with the vehicle of interest. I go into the current vehicle, but I do it totally differently, which will help you a lot more. I go to the um, initial investment, which is the down payment. And then I go into the monthly investment, the monthly payments. So I go counterclockwise on my sheet. So let's go from here. I don't know shit apparently about the Dodge, you know, uh, chargers. So let's just turn and, and use something a little bit easier, a, a Jeep compass, right? <laughs> That's it. Okay. So here's what I'm doing. Let's, we're going to skip. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We skipped your meet and greet. So assume that I engaged you at the showroom and I greeted you properly and you, you know, followed me like a, like a, you know, like a lemming to my desk. So you're sitting down and I'm going to say this. I'm like, because you ready to introduce yourself. So David, what I want to do right here is just take a couple minutes to be able to gather some information that's going to save you time and tell you right now, most of my clients love that this process, because by investing a couple minutes now, it could save us hours later on. Does that sound fair? Yeah, yeah makes okay. sense. Okay. So again, you said that you're looking for a new uh, Jeep compass, correct? A 2023 compass. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So tell me what are the features that are important to you? Um, I have to have the wireless Apple CarPlay for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to have leather seats. And then if, if we have one that has a sunroof, that's, that's a preference. It's not a deal breaker for me. Um, and then the adaptive cruise control, I need that for my ride to work. Okay. Now, the, the, what, the must-haves that I have is the cruise control and the, the, the uh, Apple CarPlay, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. The, the likes again, leather, possibly sunroof, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have a color preference? Um, I like darker colors. Yeah. I don't really wash my car a lot. So <laughs> hides, Neither do I. The, yeah. So uh, yeah. Any, anything darker is nice. I don't like straight black. I like, I think it's called a, there's like a, a granite color. I think it is. It's a, like a dark gray. Okay. That's the one I was looking at. So your first color choice would be the, the granite gray. What mm -hmm. would your second color choice be? Um, I would probably go with the, um, there's like a dark, kind of like a ruby red. I think okay. that would probably be my second one. Dark ruby red. And as far as interior, first color choice for the interior? Uh, would be black. Any, any dark color for the interior. I'm really, it really, 
uh, wouldn't matter too much. I, I've got a little two-year-old who's going to be throwing stuff all over the place, so anything that's going to hide wow. the stains. You have a two-year-old, oh, a boy or girl? He's a boy. Boy, and what's his name? Caspian. Oh, wow, that's a beautiful name. I'm actually a parent, too. I have four kids. Uh, mine a little bit older. I have a nine-year-old, a 15-year-old. Um, I got a 22-year-old, and I got a 24-year-old, as crazy as that's going to sound. <laughs> So first of all, congratulations. Um, And Caspian's your only child? Yeah, he is. Okay. All right. Now, I have a question for you. Which is more important to you, features or budget? Um, Obviously, the budget. I mean, features are great, but if I can't afford it, it doesn't matter what it has. You know, I, I, I love that you said that because, uh, again, I've been doing this for over 20 years. And when I find my clients, they fall into two categories. Some people are hyper specific on a budget, which I try to respect. At the end of the day, my job here is your advocate trying to get you not only the car of your dreams, but on the terms that you want. But then I have other clients. I have other clients that, you know, they say that they have a budget, but they want particular things and they don't care. You know, they're willing to, you know, possibly pay more for a specific item. So I want to just make sure that I'm hearing you correctly. Even though you said that your must have features are like the wireless Apple CarPlay and things like that, what's more important to you than the Apple CarPlay is fit in the budget that you and, and, and yours created. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Fair enough. Great. Now, can you tell me what the purpose of the vehicle is going to be? Uh, it's going to be a daily driver. Um, and then, possibly using it on a couple trips, uh, vacations and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Okay. Do you have any plans or any upcoming vacations? Uh, no, but we're always shooting up to Atlanta to, to visit, um, Caspian's grandparents and stuff like that. So absolutely. Atlanta is beautiful. Oh yeah. Now you said we, so who's going to be the primary driver of this vehicle? Um, I'll be the primary driver. And then sometimes my girlfriend's going to drive it as well. Okay. And your girlfriend's name is? Rose. Rose? Okay. Now, are you going to be adding anyone else to the title? No, nah, it would just be in my name. Okay, perfect. Now, just so I know, are there any other vehicles that you're considering besides the 2023 Jeep Compass? Mm, that's our main one. The only other one that we were looking at was a uh, possibly a RAV4. Oh, I got to tell you that the RAV4s are, are also uh, beautiful vehicles. But I'm going to show you why the Jeep Compass is Motor Trends. I'm making this up. The Motor Trends truck of the year for compact SUVs and yada, yada, yada. But I'm writing that down. Boom. So now, uh, David, quick question for you. What kind of vehicle are you currently driving right now? So I don't really see why. Why does that matter? Oh, because um, I'm assuming you want to get the absolute best deal, correct? Of course. Yeah. Okay, well, David, a lot of people don't realize this, but the manufacturers have money and incentives that are not open to the public. For example, there might be what's called conquest money. So if you have a certain vehicle that's not a Chrysler Dot Jeep Ram, there might be money that manufacturers will be able to allow me to pass on to you um, to be able to incentivize you to come out. Then there's also a possibility there might be what's called owner loyalty. So if you're a current Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram owner, there might be a money that's there to incentivize you to stay with the brand. On top of that, I don't want to stress you, but there's going to be a couple other questions I'm going to ask you. For example, there's special... Um, rebates that the manufacturers give for military law enforcement etc so the reason why i'm asking you is what kind of car you're driving is i need to know to see what type of money that i could give to you that's not readily open to the public does that make sense yeah no that makes sense okay so uh what type of vehicle are you driving right now actually i i do already drive a, a chrysler pro- i drive a, a ram 1500 you got great taste all right welcome yeah. back i love it so you what year is your your ram 1500 um it's a it's a 21 Okay. Wow. That's, it's pretty new. So what's making you switch from a 2021 into a 2023 uh, Jeep compass? Well, it's, um, it's no longer has a utility for me. So I was doing landscaping for a while and now just kind of change of employment. So it just makes more sense to save a little bit on gas. And, but I like the cabin space. So that's why I was looking at an SUV. I like to sit up a little higher too. No, absolutely. So uh, what color is that vehicle? It is that granite gray. 
Ah, that's how you knew that. Because I was, I was honestly wondering, how does he know about Granite Gray? All right. Now, do you know the approximate mileage on, on that uh, vehicle? I think it's got about, I want to say 28,000. Okay, 28,000. And condition from one to five, five being garage kept, one meaning we got to tow it in. What would you say? Gotcha. I would give it about a, about a three. I mean, like I said, I did use it to do landscaping. So I definitely um, got its dings here and there, okay, but no, it's totally still, it still yeah. definitely doesn't look like, it still looks like a 2021. You can tell it's still a pretty fat, relatively new truck. Okay. So I'm going to probably upgrade that to a four then. Awesome. All right. So now do you have a payoff on the vehicle? Um, Not the exact payoff. I think, I think I checked last time and it was right around, I want to say 37. 37. Okay. Now, um, were you previously financing or leasing that vehicle? It was financed. Okay, finance. Do you recall the lender? Um, Chrysler Capital. Chrysler Capital. Well, this is going to be a lot easier because I obviously am a Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership. Um, do you have access to the VIN number? It's usually on the registration card or the insurance card. Because it's easier. What happens is we take the VIN, I put it into my Chrysler computer, and it lets me know all the incentives and all the money that you qualify for. Do you have access yeah. to that? Yeah, I can pull up the, the insurance card if you want, and I can just Absolutely perfect. text it to you or email it to you. Okay, so then pause. You give me that information. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Now, David, are you looking to possibly trade that vehicle in? Um, I'd like to look at trading it and see where I'm at as far as if I do have, if I have the ability to trade it in without it costing me more on my monthly payment. Because I know sometimes when you trade it in, you end up having to put something on the back end of the new loan. And I just... I don't, I don't really know how all that works, but I, I don't want to end up paying more for something. Yeah, no, absolutely not. To be honest with you, I don't know if anybody's there shows with you. There's some significant benefits um, in trading in a vehicle. One of them is what's called a tax break savings. So let's say, for example, you're looking at a you know $40,000 vehicle. And what is the state tax in Augusta? It's, uh, I want to say it's 6.6. Okay. Let's just say that you are at twenty six hundred dollars approximately in in tax. If we were going to you just uh, you know give you uh, full tax on that vehicle, however, let's just say that your trade in minus the payoff, there's a difference. Let's just say that there's going to be ten thousand dollars equity. I'm just making this up as an example. You, you wouldn't get taxed on the forty thousand dollars. You would get taxed on the difference. You would only get taxed on the thirty thousand. So there is an actual financial benefit in trading in your vehicle on top of the peace of mind that you don't have to sell it out and deal with the person and all the other details that go through for the convenience aspect of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we're going to do when, and when we start to take a look at this um, 2023 Jeep compass, I'm going to have one of our certified appraisers see how much equity that you have in the vehicle. But I'm going to tell you this right now, because we are a Chrysler dealer, um, we would absolutely love to have that vehicle on our lot. I mean, because as you know, with the pandemic, we're in an inventory crisis. Vehicles are super expensive. They're hard to come by. So when we find a vehicle that's a freaking 2021 with, with low miles on it like that. Now, to us, it's low miles. To you, it might be a little bit high because you're landscaping, but it's still only 28,000 miles. That will be an incredible vehicle for us to put on our front line. So I'm actually thinking we might be able to get you more for that vehicle than it's worth. How does that sound, David? I mean, that sounds good. That's what I want. You know, okay, well, you that's make what that I'm here to do. Okay, so let's go with this. Would you, if we're able to put a deal together today, would you be interested in us assisting you with financing or leasing? Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. So now, how is your credit on a scale of one to eight? Think of this like a credit bureau report from, you know, from, from one of the bureaus is like uh, 500, 600, 700, 800, et cetera. So that's why we like to use one to eight instead of one to 10. So eight being perfect on the scale, one being not perfect. How would you rate your credit from one to eight? I'm probably about a seven. All right. Awesome. That sounds like you're going to qualify for our tier one or tier two uh, financing options. Now, Dave, this is important for, for me to say this like this. The banks suggest, but they don't require that you put 20% down. The reason being is that if you put 20% down, it's an automatic tier bump. So for example, I might tell you might be a tier one or tier two. If you're a tier two credit, but if you put 20% down, 
you automatically get bumped to a tier one, which is the absolute best uh, lending terms and interest rates. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so does. is that, are you comfortable to put 20% down? Um, I'd like to see, I mean, what that, what that factors out to, but I do have some, some money that I could put down. All right, so I'll give an example. So let's just say, let's take your, the, the trade possibility out of this until we could do an equity assessment just to put dollars to dollars here. If you're looking at a $40,000 vehicle, approximately, uh, again, uh, 20% is about $8,000. Are you comfortable to put $8,000 down on this? Yeah, that's, that's a little steep. I might just, I could buy a cash car for eight grand. I mean, I was, I, I, I might have a thousand dollars I can put down. Okay. So if you put a, th- listen again, like I said to you, this is not a requirement and this is not for me. The bank suggested you put 20% down just from that tear jump. You did say that you believe your credit is a seven out of an eight. So that might not be necessary. So you're comfortable putting $1,000 down, but you're also going to put your taxes and motor vehicles. Is that correct? Um, well, you told me about the tax break and everything. So we'll, we'll see what those come out to. I know for sure I can do the thousand dollars down. I don't know if I can do any more than that. But if you had to, David, only if you had to, do you think you'd be able to come up with an extra $1,500? If I absolutely had to, and I absolutely loved the car, I could only if you love the car. Cause I'm gonna tell you right now, if you didn't love the car, I wouldn't want you to buy this. Okay. This is going to be you know, one of the most expensive items you're going to buy. I want you to absolutely love this vehicle. And again, only if you have to, David, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, cool. So we're having that there. Now, Dave, remember before when we first started the conversation and I was asking you what's important to you, um, budget or features, which is the most important to you? You told me budget, correct? Yes, sir. So did you and Rose create a budget for yourself before you came in today? Um. I have I have a number in mind. It's more uh, uh, since it's going to be my car. It's it's ultimately up to me. I okay, mean, well, the, what was the budget that you had in mind, David? So I don't want to go above uh, six hundred a month. Okay, so six hundred a month times sixty months is around $36,000 right there. So I'm just doing just basic math here. So $600 times 60 months, which is a five-year finance, that's about $36,000. Now, I do understand that, you know, there's a potential trading situation here and you have potentially equity in that vehicle, but we also got to factor in tax, tags, registration, motor vehicles, and then the interest, which compounds annually. I'm not saying it's going to be impossible, but just so I know, before I go present this to my management, the scenario, I want to just get all the variables here. You're saying you're, you didn't want to go past 600. Again, I'm going to use what I just said to you before. David, only if you had to. If you had to go to 675, would you be able to do that? I'd have to take a look at the insurance, but I could possibly make it work. It's, it's okay. got to because it's got to come from somewhere else if I'm going to budget more money in there. But it's it's possible. Once again, like I said, it's you know if if I fall in love with the car, I can probably make it happen. Absolutely. Okay. Stop narrative. Now, there's a couple other. This is now me as a trainer. Gotcha. So again, what I'm doing here is I just wanted to take now for me it would be a little bit different if I was doing this for real. I'm trying to train you and do a live stream podcast that is here, but do you see the difference? I'm going to point out a couple of the differences that are here. I asked a couple key questions. Now me, I gave up a little bit of the information with my wife and stuff like that. When we f- switch roles, you see how I, I, I threw that in there. I said, um, you know, who's going to be the primary driver of the vehicle? Boom. You said you, I said, are you going to add anyone to the title? The reason why I asked this is because if I only have one person in front of me and somebody says, I got to add somebody else to the title. Hello, Houston, we might have a problem. Yeah. Why am I going to wait to like going through and spend an hour or some change or longer with somebody and then find that the other decision maker isn't there. So I just, this is more for everybody listening to this. Right. But did you see how strategic I went into the current vehicle? You didn't do a bad job at all with the, with the first part of the vehicle of interest. You looked at a couple pieces. I just gave you a little more details, but where I kind of went a little bit different than from your strategy was the current vehicle. And I even tried to make you 
give me, make, make it difficult for me. Cause I said, I whispered, I was like, you know, ask why, you know I mean? Cause real customers will say, why do you want to know that? And the yeah. reason why I want to train you in difficult adverse situations is because there's a lot of blogs out there. There's a lot of websites that advise the public not to disclose the trade information until you get to the dealership or until the very end. Me, I'm giving you a reason. I've got to always remember what's in it for them. I'm telling you straight up that the reason why I'm asking this for you is because it has solely to do with you. That's a little white lie. It's not really a lie. You know what I mean? It's true, but I do have an ulterior motive. It is because yeah. most manufacturers and depending because of the pandemic protocol, you know, they have incentives that change on a monthly basis. There is something called conquest money. There is something called owner loyalty money. There are, there is something called, you know, military law enforcement and first responders. There is something called college grad. So if you think about this, if I didn't do my due diligence to ask those questions right here, how the hell can I give them the, the right accurate first pencil? And that's the best time to ask for it. But what I'm really trying to do is you always want to get the trade information Here's why, because one of the main ways to structure a deal is the trade-in, whether it's because of the equity or it's because of the, you know, the, 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 the book value on it that we could put down. We could show, you know, X amount more than the car is worth for the banks. I mean, again, there's so many different strategies, but the other reason is I, especially now, I want to find out every person in front of me, if I could buy their car, because that's one of my secret ninja uh, resources as a salesperson. Think about this. If I am the only person in the entire dealership, not even the owner knows yet that, that this person's coming in with a 2021, you know, Ram 1500, with only 28,000 miles. You know what I'm thinking about? As I'm selling you this car, I'm thinking, who the hell can I sell this guy's trade into? And I want to get that vehicle, not only for, so I can make more money for the, for the deal, so I can make more commissions, but now, I want to make even more money by selling this guy's trade because I'm going to have the first shot to sell this thing because I'm the first one that knows about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. The other aspect is so there's, a, as, there's an actual strategy in car sales called the trade hook. What the trade hook is, is basically, you know, if somebody's not happy with any of the other variables, I could give them hope because there's only one used car like it. A used car is like a fingerprint, a snowflake, whatever. There's only one car like that with the condition, the miles, the options, the this, the that. So I could use those words literally. I said, listen, I might be able to get you more for your vehicle than it's worth. You know what people hear when I say that? It's selective hearing. They hear, I'm going to absolutely give you more than your vehicle's worth. That's not what I said. I said, I might be able to get you more for your vehicle than it's worth. And I might be able to, you know, depending on the condition and, and how my desk manager feels, obviously. Yeah. Now, but I'm asking qualifying questions. Remember when I asked you about the bank, like, you know, where you financing and what your lender is. I'm just trying to gather field intelligence. I'm trying to see, okay, does this prospect have a uh, propensity to lease or finance? What did they do before? Because if they did it before, they might be willing to do that again here. I'm also looking at what type of lender. Now, this is not exact science. This is not voodoo either, but these are little signals. If somebody tells me that they're going through, um, you know, like back in the day, like AmeriCredit or, you know, a, one of these subprime banks, then I, then I know red flag, red flag, this person might have a credit situation. So then I know I need to tread carefully going forward before I start showing them vehicles all over the lot that they're not qualified for. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But the big difference is like I was telling you is the way that I handle the down payment. I handle that down payment like a G. Okay. Because I know that the key to profitability in a deal is down payment. Now, I'm not psychic. We never rehearsed this. But if you work at a Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership in Augusta, Georgia, or the surrounding areas, I'm sure you've done some special finance deals. True or false? Yeah. Huh. Hell yeah. So if that's the case, you and I both know that if you've got a subprime customer, what else do you have? A heavy bank fee, right or wrong? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, it is imperative to try to get as much down as you can. Now, think about what I'm saying here. There's a couple different avenues. I'm asking that the, the word track is the bank suggest, but don't require that you put 20% down. And I don't wait for them to say, why are you crazy? I say, the reason is if you put 20% down, it's an automatic credit bump. You get bumped from tier three to tier two, from tier two to tier one, and you get the most advantageous scenario. These are all true things. And I have not lied. I have not manipulated. I've told the truth. However, it's for my self-benefit and the dealership self-benefit first. 
Okay, because I'm trying to get maximum gross potential. I'm trying to get maximum, you know, ammunition to go to the banks. Because if this person does have a special finance situation, they might not be able to put 20% down, but now their their mind is calibrated. Because look at the different scenario. You're like, uh, you want to take advantage of, of the zero down payment? Are you kidding me? Like, who's going to say no? Yeah, I don't want to put shit down. Here am I. I'm I'm going the complete opposite. I'm hitting you high. I'm like, hey, the bank suggests don't require that you put 20% down. You you were going to put have me put zero down and you were okay with it. I'm trying to get you to cough up eight G's. And you're like, <laughs> I can't do eight G's. Okay, Mr. Customer, then share me what you're thinking. Ah, a thousand. And I didn't take that on the chin because some salespeople would have been like, oh my God, I can't believe you're going to put $1,000. No, I was like, listen, David, if you have to, only if you have to, could you come up with an extra whatever, whatever, right? See, for me, even if you said, like, look at my, like, like my line right here. Even if you had said I could put the 20% down without blinking, I would do what's called an assumptive transition. So let's play this out. Just say, yes, I could do that. So David, the bank suggests you put 20% down. They don't require it, but if you do put the 20% down, it's almost it's a guaranteed credit bump, which means you get the, the most advantageous financing scenario and, and terms. Uh, are you comfortable with 20, putting 20% down? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay, perfect. So in addition to the 20% down, you are also going to put down your taxes and your motor vehicle. See, it's I don't care what I'm taking that shot. Do you understand me? If yeah. they say they're putting 20, that's the down payment. That's the that's called a cap cost reduction. That is like you said to lower the payments. That has nothing to do with taxes and that has nothing to do with motor vehicles. See, if we're untrained or we're lazy, we try to lump it all in. How much are you gonna put down? No. The bank suggests that you put 20% down. They don't require it, but they suggest it. Is that comfortable for you? It's either yes or no. No, not a problem. What were you thinking? Share with you what you're thinking. I could do a thousand. Okay. Um, if you put a thousand dollars down, you're still going to cover the taxes, tags, and motor vehicles, correct? It's an automatic bump. I'm trying to get all of the money because I'm telling you, you can't, people don't give back the money. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't go back down. So if I don't ask for all the money, I'm never going to get it. So I'm going to ask for all of it until they don't want to give it. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. When I said to you the statement, only if you had to. Well, guess what? Most of the time, you're going to have to. That's the inside. That's the sales strategy here. Same thing with the monthly investment. Did you like how I cued that back up? Because I planted that seed in the very beginning of the conversation. When I asked you that strategic question, David, just so I know, what's more important to you, budget or features? Almost everybody says budget. Most people are payment shoppers, right? I know that. And I and look, I didn't hit them in the beginning like you did. You hit me in the beginning of what I want to pay for the vehicle and blah, blah, blah. You don't know me like that right yet. You didn't develop a, a rapport with me. I didn't get to see if I liked you or not. And you're asking me about my budget, man. You're just one of these scumbag car people. Not you really, but I'm just thinking a prospect that's trying to take my money. Now, I didn't do all that. I've been your advocate the whole entire time. I haven't been doing anything but gathering real strategic information like a banker or a mortgage broker. I'm being thoroughly professional. I'm not being thirsty. I'm not being shady. But then I bring it back to you and it's my closing thing. Like for this section, for the, for the qualification, I'm now saying what? Hey, David, remember in the beginning when you said budget or features, you said budget was important. So I want to respect your wishes. I want to honor what you came in here with. Just so I know, what were you thinking in regards of your budget? And you said 600. And I said, okay, not a problem, David. I'm going to try to do that for you. Just so I know though, if you had to, only if you had to, would you be able to do 675? And then I'm now bumping. Do you understand how much money I just made off of that? So watch, $75 times 60 months, that bump was $4,500. That's over 60 months. What if I bump them term? If I go from 60 months to 66 months. So again, if I turn around and go $75 times 66 months, holy shit, I'm at 4,950. I added a gross to the deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Ask me questions, my brother. What's up? Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing everything. It it makes a whole lot of sense. I, I don't have a whole lot of questions to be honest with you. I'm kind of just taking notes and taking it all in. It is nothing, nothing that's not understandable. Definitely had some holes in my game and I definitely can understand why you would approach those things those ways. It just, I, I like, I think the best part about it is you're, 
almost asking for a down payment three different times. <laughs> Boom, 20%. I know you can't do that. Okay, what can you do? All right, well, can you do your taxes and fees? Oh, you can't do that? Okay, well, if you absolutely had to, then can you, and it's like same, so, so you're giving them, you know, kind of three strikes and then you're, okay, you tell me no three times, then, you know, then I'll actually believe you, but I'm going to at least take the swing. And it's take, I, I like how you worded it because it's taking the swing in a way to where you're not just same question, same question, same question. And like you said, um, building the, building the role as the advocate and the consultant instead of just, let me get your info. Let me show you the car. Let's do some paperwork on to the next kind of thing. Yeah. And in other details, sales is a relationship business. Notice that you mentioned your two-year-old. I, I stopped engagement right there and I zoned on it. Sometimes salespeople forget that. Consultants forget that this is a relationship business. Are you kidding me? This guy just mentioned his son. You, the guy, of course, mentioned his son. I'm an asshole if I don't turn around and stop and acknowledge it in my head, you know, as a parent of four kids. So I turned around and I asked, I didn't, I wrote that shit down. Caspian right there, two years old. Your girlfriend's name is Rose. I got that in there. I'm going to add that to my CRM, you know, uh, if you're giving me any type of field intelligence, not just about the car, I'm trying to gather as much field. Hell, if you're wearing a, you know, go Eagles. I'm from Philly area. So, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, don't hate on me over here. But again, if you have an Eagles jersey on, not that you would, but if you did, I'm taking note of everything. Everything I see, everything I hear is potential field intelligence to build your prospect profile to help me do one thing, to structure a value package proposition and, and give you a reason to do business with me. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Makes All right. So sense. now I'm going to transition and spend like five more minutes and then I'm going to let you go back to your, you know, your day is that I'm telling you right now, what you should do is really focus on your skills. There should be two aspects of, of your focus right now. One is your skills. You self-admitted that, you know what I mean? You kind of coasted through the OEM certification, the product certification details. Uh, again, you already said that the dealership didn't provide any formal road to the sale training and, and you know, those type of trainings. And I did a quick audit and you did okay, but listen to me. Do you want to be average or or like a little bit above average you know what average is to me and there's a there's an old school trainer uh named jim ziggler that says this all the time average is the leader of the sucks right or wrong yeah right no for real that's what the average is average is a leader of the sucks and so i don't want to be the least ugly person that that my wife says i'll marry you i'm gonna marry you because you're the least ugly person now I'll take the win. Don't get me wrong. I got a hot wife. You know what I'm saying? But still, I, I, when I close my eyes, I'm like, oh, God damn. Did she just say that like, she said yes, because I'm the least ugly person. I don't want to be the least ugly man. That's, you know what I mean? Like, that's not cool to win like that. You don't want to win because other people suck worse than you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You want to win because you are the absolute best choice. You're the only choice. And the way that you do that is by personifying the fact that you are the best freaking product specialist, the best consultant, the best concierge, the best person for that particular prospect. That's what this is about, brother. Now, you asked me a question about building your own business and things like that. I promise you, I will turn around and, and do another one of these, you know, when you do some of this basic stuff, but I will give you this tip, okay? You need to immerse yourself into the community, as I said to you before, if you want the community to buy from you, that if you want people to refer people to you, you need to be part of the community. Uh, again, you seem young. I don't know what you do. You know what I mean for fun or what have you. Sorry, my son's coming up. With nah, don't apologize for being a dad, brother. Respect. Do your thing. I'm cool with that. Oh, yeah. You know, hundred percent. But no, what, okay, I got him. You, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I know. I know you gotta go. You can go. It's okay. I've, I've, I respect that you're trying to do this and be a dad at the same time. You, yeah. You're trying to be successful. It's all good. I love it, man. I love it. That's, that's motivation right there. But you got to try to immerse yourself in the community. Aw. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. He's, he's about to be famous, this kid. <laughs> I just changed his life. You know what I mean? So I'm going to go let you be a dad, uh, but I'm going to say to you this, here's a, an easy, easy thing that you can do that everybody could do that, no, that most people don't do. Remember three questions I want you to ask everybody, everywhere, every day. I'm going to repeat that statement. I'm going to give you three questions I want you to ask everybody, everywhere, every day. Question okay. number one is, 
Are you in the market for a vehicle? And don't get mad at me. Don't throw shit at the computer. Like I'm dead serious, right? Are you in the market for a vehicle? Here's why, because everybody, David, that you come in contact with needs to buy a car today, or they will need to buy a car in the future, or they know somebody that needs to buy a car today, or they know somebody that's going to need to buy a car in the future. True or false? True. Exactly. So you want to ask everybody everywhere you go every day, these three questions. Number one is, are you in the market for a vehicle? It's yes or no. Second question, let's say they say no is, okay, who do you know that's in the market for a vehicle? Why do you want to know that? Because I am a senior uh, sales consultant at ABC Motors, and we have a referral program. If you refer somebody to me, I will pay you $200. Now, David, does your dealership have a bird dog fee or referral fee that they, they offer? Not anymore. Okay, well, then guess what? You should come up with out of your pocket. Again, think about this. If somebody doesn't refer somebody to you, then you don't lose anything. Scared money don't make any money. Do you see what I'm saying? So again, this is only for, a, you're not going to pay out a bullshit referral. You're going to pay out if somebody really gave you some money. So think about it. You've got to incentivize people, whether it's by just asking and being a great person. Some people are just going to give you natural organic referrals. However, other people might need incentive, whether that's you are bartering with them or you're paying them or you're exchanging services. For example, like you, if I were you, I would find any real estate agents or any mortgage brokers or any insurance agents and say, hey, look, I'm in sales just like you. If you could you know, refer anybody to me that's uh, in the market for a vehicle and if I sell them, you know, not only will I give you a little bit of money, whatever I could do, a gift card or this, that, and the other thing, if you don't want to pay them cash, uh, but I will reciprocate. Anybody that I ever hear in my world, I'm around a lot of people at the dealership that needs insurance or, or house or mortgage, I'm going to refer you. You. So it's called reciprocal referrals. You know what I mean? But regardless, if you can get some money to give somebody, that's a really good incentive too. Not the only incentive, but it's a good one. And here's the third one. If they say, I don't know anybody. Okay. What kind of car are you driving? Why do you want to know that? Well, because I just mentioned I work at a car dealership and we're in a freaking pandemic and there's an inventory crisis and my owners are actually going over book value. They're, they're, it's crazy. They're depending on the condition. I might be able to get you more for your vehicle than it's worth. So I'm going to repeat that. Are you in the market for a vehicle? Who do you know that's in the market for a vehicle and what kind of car are you driving? I am telling you, Brother, if you just go to YouTube and type in Sean V. Bradley ups waiter, Sean V. Bradley ups waitress, Sean V. Bradley ups tattoo artist, there are videos with me in the field and you could tell it's not staged or fake. It's, I'm at a tattoo shop, like in a Game of Thrones pose and I'm getting these tattoos on me and stuff like that. And I'm having a conversation with a tattoo artist. And at first she's like, no. And I'm like, and then I'm like, listen, how would you like to make an extra six to $7,000 a year for doing practically nothing? I am a high level consultant at ABC Motors over here. And we have a referral program. All you got to do is say to me, Hey, Sean, I know somebody that might be interested in the vehicle. And if I happen to sell them, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars. You don't have to do anything. Just do what you do every day. And if somebody happens to mention, they want to buy a car, let me know. Think about this. This is what people don't think about. There's, there's called microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics is you selling a car to one person or trying to sell a car to one person every day versus macroeconomics that you're trying to sell a car, not fleet, but you're trying to sell a car to the police department in, in Augusta, the Augusta police department, the Augusta fire department, or the local church or whatever it is. Or if you're able to find a referral agent like, think about this. Can you imagine how awesome it would be if you could get somebody that's a referral agent that would be able to give you referrals on a daily or weekly basis? David, this is a direct question. Like, no bullshit. If you, how cool would that be if you were able to get a legitimate referral agent, like somebody that, that's a bartender or worked at a gym or somebody that had access to a lot of people and they were able to pump you with referrals even on a weekly basis? If they were able to give you two or three referrals per week, how sick would that be for you? Oh, that'd be, I mean, that's invaluable. I'm going to say something. Is your son around? No. 
good. So I'm a, I, I appreciate to speak freely, right? Then yeah. what the fuck are you doing? If you just said it's a great thing, then go figure out how to find these fucking people, right or wrong. See, the problem is that when we sell cars, we're so busy with the fucking crumbs trying to sell one car to one person. We don't ever think outside the box. I mean, again, stop being Blockbuster or Yellow Cab or Macy's. Be Airbnb, be Uber, be Netflix. Think outside the box. Think, man, how can I get somebody to give me referrals on a daily or weekly basis? And then that's what you got to do. That's your mission. I don't care if it takes you one day, five days, a week, two months. But damn it, when you get that person, that referral agent to pump your referrals on a weekly basis, man, cha-ching. And then you know what you do? Get another one. And then another one, like Khaled, another one. You feel me? Yeah. Get another one. And then what you're trying to do is now you've got referrals coming from this area. Then you have your internet, your social media and this. And what you're doing is you're diversifying everything. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? It does. It does. All right. Listen, my brother, it's five o'clock. I stayed a lot longer on this because I'm trying to help you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and again, this shit was completely free for everybody out there. I didn't get a dollar. Yeah. I mean, I'm working like, like I just started. I'm working like I'm an ugly stripper and it's New Year's Eve. You feel me? <laughs> I appreciate that. I do. Yeah. Did you get value on this? I did. I did. I got a whole lot of value on it. Did you have fun? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's what you got to do when we get off of here. Um, cause you said you switched your profile when you left, you need to go to, that's my family by there that I had them Simpsonized. That's legit. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but what you need to go to is you need to go to the, uh, the, the millionaire car salesman group and join because check this out. You're streaming right now. There's like only four people. Left Cause this is a long ass thing. It was an like hour and 20 minutes, but you are streaming in front of 24,000 803 people in here. But when you join the group, it's free. You'll be able to watch our session again and again and again for free. How cool is awesome. that? Yeah. Yeah, that works. That's that's what I need to. All right, my brother. Well, listen, I hope this, this was valuable. If it is, I only ask one small thing in return. Please go to Google, find Dealer Synergy and leave me a review. I feel like I earned it. You feel like I earned it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, now you also notice I lead by examples. You want to make sure that you are always asking for reviews. Okay, it's very important. Shakespeare said, show me your friends and I'll tell you are. Meaning, again, people are influenced by what other people say. So again, I've got over 2,300 video testimonies, video reviews on YouTube. I got hundreds and hundreds of, you know, Google reviews because of stuff like this. So there you have it. The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. This podcast comes to you every week from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you have a question about the show or would like the chance to become a guest, feel free to contact us directly at 856-546-2440 or email us at millionairecarsalesman at gmail.com. This program is a presentation of Synergy Records. Produced by Tiana Mick and L.A. Williams. Production and engineering by L.A. Williams. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is hosted every week by L.A. Williams and the millionaire car salesman himself, Sean V. Bradley. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast can be found everywhere, so please don't forget to review, subscribe to, and share the show. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast. And remember, where I'm from, money provides options. If you enjoyed this podcast, then make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave us a review. You know, let some other folks know about it. Oh, and don't forget to join the Millionaire Car Salesman group on Facebook. We'll see you there.